Oh joy, a test. I love tests. My thanks to PT1 Guard who sent me a request to answer 10 questions that he is supposedly asking many Apollo program defenders to answer and then he supposedly wants to put them in a book. Well, that's lovely. He has asked for my legal name. <laughs> Brilliant. Since it's legal for me to call myself Lunar Tuner on YouTube, I guess that is my legal name. So please refer to me in your book as Lunar Tuner. Thank you. Let's jump into this test. Question one. Why isn't there any dust inside the lunar module landing cups? Landing cups? Oh, how charming. First, the landing cups are called foot pads. I would think that if PT researched this issue, he would have discovered that. But maybe research is just too demanding, especially for someone with such strong opinions. Second, check these landing photos, PT. You can find these at any of the Apollo image archive sites all over the internet. And as you can see, there is some debris on some of these foot pads. Third, the foot pads each had a lip, which is several inches high. It was there to deflect the dust, which comes up from the surface of the moon. That was the lip of the cup's sole purpose. Fourth, in a vacuum and in gravity one-sixth that of Earth, all debris under the engines would travel well beyond the four landing pads. Fifth, the lunar module landed with only approximately 2,600 pounds of thrust. Much of the loose regolith, you know, the top two to five inches, was already blown away long before the lunar module was anywhere near the surface. Study of lunar regolith by the U.S. and the Soviet unmanned spacecrafts revealed that regolith becomes increasingly dense and compact just a few inches below the surface. So what was there really to blow around by the time the lunar module landed? Sixth, the engines were cut immediately after the five foot long contact probes touched the surface. So if engines were cut at, let's say, three to four feet above the surface, the thrust when the foot pads were on the surface would be very low. It would just be residual fuel burning off and that's not gonna cause a lot of dust all over the landing cups. Seventh, the images that we have of the Apollo foot pads is consistent with the images that we have from other unmanned landers like Surveyor and the Soviet Luna landers. Not much dust is seen on those landing foot pads either. Let's move to question two. Why can't the knots agree if there was a noise coming from the engines? Cernan and Bean disagree. PT, your question is based on an assumption formed by two edited comments used in Bart Sibrel's When Astronauts Go Wild. May I suggest to you that you widen your research? In fact, Cernan and Bean both agree. It's not unusual for two people to see the same thing from two different perspectives and for them both to be correct. Context dictates the meaning of their statements. Unfortunately, Sibrel robs us of context. That's why we need to look at something other than his film. You see, the engine is both silent and loud. It depends on the context. When you were in it, you couldn't hear it in the vacuum of space. This is true. Once the RCS engines, like the other hypergolic engines used around the world in space travel, is up to speed, it's almost silent. Insulation from inside the spacecraft reduces vibration, and the vacuum of space means that no matter outside the spacecraft can expand and produce that rumbling that you hear when you've operated a spacecraft in Earth atmosphere. So. It seems silent. Cernan's quote says this. Well, the engine is very loud. It's very difficult to tell the difference between feeling sound and hearing sound, but yes, it's loud. This is also true. The engine is loud. It's loud when tested or operated on Earth or in atmosphere. As being noted, it's silent once it's running, but that doesn't nullify the fact that it is a noisy engine. Cernan knows that because the first ignition creates a loud bang as gases combust within the chamber that is inside the lunar module. That bang is real, but then it subsides. Both guys are right. Question number three. Why did Ed Mitchell go many times to the shrink Robert Masters and ask him to help him remember being on the moon. You know, why don't you ask Ed Mitchell? At any rate, a statement from the book Moon Dust by Andrew Smith may help us out here. It says this on page 52. Unlike most of his colleagues, he, that is Mitchell, decided that the problem was not with the questioners, but with himself and the anguish he felt at being unable to recall the feeling of being there. 
Apparently, Mitchell remembered his experience just fine, cognitively, but because of the intense labor, hard work on the moon, the intense schedule, he took no time to reflect on how it felt to him personally. He sought narcohypnosis to relive the experience and to formulate his own feelings. Hey, have you ever had an experience in life that you wished you could relive? A great vacation? But why are you asking this? If it was at all a hoax like you believe, why would he seek a psychologist to help him remember it? Eh? Question number four. How did the Hasselblad cams keep the film from being ruined with no ways to cool the camera? Film curls at 170 degrees in an oven, yet at 250 on the moon it turned out fine. First, PT, does all film curl at 170 degrees? The film base of Ektachrome E3 film, which was used on the moon, is polyester. You can't melt that below 550 degrees Fahrenheit. 250 degrees Fahrenheit is only the moon's surface temperature at midday. Just which Apollo astronaut was rolling his film around on the surface? All Apollo moonwalks were performed during lunar morning. Nobody was even there during midday. There were long shadows in the morning. The temperatures in those shadows were extremely cold. A sunlit lunar module, a rock, or an astronaut can heat dramatically on the sunlit side. The shadow sides cool just as dramatically. So by moving, astronauts and the cameras they were carrying, avoided extremes and temperatures were just moderated. Third, Hasselblad film was never removed from its magazine and directly exposed to the sunlight. Duh! That's the only way one could have exposed it to 250 degrees Fahrenheit because there's no air to transmit this temperature to the inside of the camera. Study thermodynamics, please. Of course, to take the film out of the camera would have instantly destroyed all the images anyway. Film always remains in canisters and magazines because it needs to stay out of light. And the moon is not an oven. Ovens have air. Since there is no air to transfer heat through convection, the film was nice and cozy inside, sealed in its Hasselblad camera. Thank you. Fourth, all spacewalks deal with the same temperature issues. Whether Gemini, Vostok, Skylab, Mir, International Space Station, shuttle missions, they all have temperature issues that are nearly the same. The sun is hot. The shade is cold. Hasselblad cameras remain essentially the same since the Apollo era, and they still work just fine. Thank you. Have you ever thought about asking about those other missions? Question number five. Where are all the tire tracks in the pictures on my Colette Moon hoax video? First, lunar rovers often don't make deep tracks at all. Fully loaded, its lunar weight is only 250 pounds. That's not a three-ton Chevy pickup truck with rubber wheels. Also, the metal Chevron-style wheels on the lunar rover are porous, and so lunar dust went right through them like a sieve. Lunar rover tracks just aren't deep or dramatic. Second, many photos taken with the sun directly behind the photographer will reveal very little details in the lunar dust, or for that matter, on the beach or in the desert. From a different angle, those tracks could have easily been seen, but not with the sun directly behind you. Third, when the LRV sat motionless for long periods, any tracks it left could easily be obscured by dust kicked up by working astronauts that are working around the LRV, which carried a lot of their equipment and experiments. For example, this happened during the fender repair of the Apollo 17 rover, one of the pictures in your little film. Fourth, the LRV could literally turn within its own radius, so sometimes there are images where the tracks seem to disappear because the LRV just turned right over the top of them. Fifth, your Colette Moon hoax video shows about six photos. Your video is not the only exhibit of LRV info. Dozens and dozens of photos show LRV tracks and video shows the LRV making those tracks. Um, where did those come from? Question number six. How would you describe the knots behavior in their Apollo 11 press conference? The Apollo 11 astronauts received unprecedented attention and pressure from thousands of media sources. And at the post-mission briefing, they appeared professional, they appeared careful, they looked a bit uncomfortable, and they certainly looked tired. These men weren't chosen for their professional grasp of public relations, but because they were good at aeronautics, piloting ability, and physical strength and courage. In fact, their commander, Armstrong, was notorious for his private, shy manner. Sleep 
during the mission and during post-mission quarantine is less than normal, and the astronauts had already endured NASA's own exhaustive post-mission questioning. These guys are sick of it. To me, they looked exactly as tired, shy pilots would look when bombed with poorly worded questions by a room of obsessed journalists. These aren't men trained to take credit for their accomplishments or to express wild emotions, but quite the opposite. Besides, your or my subjective opinion of their behavior is useless. Try science. Try something objective for once. Question number seven. How on live feeds can the knots communicate back to NASA in 0.53 seconds, such as the Nixon on-phone interview? You know, PT, it annoys me that you call these guys knots. Whether you believe they made it to the moon or not, they certainly went into space, which was a phenomenal physical and intellectual achievement of great courage for that time. Something which is recognized around the world, but ignored by grand, wonderful people of great renown like you. I can't even find what you're referring to with this question. You're probably listening to an edited copy of this thing. First of all, it has to be understood that all Apollo communications were recorded on Earth. Therefore, any response given by Earth-bound personnel would carry no delay, the same as for ordinary pilot-to-ground communications. Second, no ordinary conversation is perfectly consistent. Often, responses are only made after time to think and reflect. Sometimes, conversants talk over the top of each other. Come on, you You've done this. Who do you know who has a perfectly timed conversation? Do you, do you have relatives and friends that are robots? Third, in the Nixon phone call recording, the echo of the president can clearly be heard as the astronauts' headset microphones picked up Nixon's words and doubled them. And this certainly has to be the most historic telephone call ever made. I just can't tell you. That's proof right there that they were very far away. Fourth, hundreds of Apollo videos are edited versions where things like the Nixon phone call and many other EVA videos are cut for purposes of keeping the video short. If you listen to the direct copy of the two-minute phone conversation, there is no 0.53 second response from the astronauts. It's not there. It's exactly as I and millions of others heard it when it was done live. Question number eight. What do you make of the Pad 34 disaster and the fact that PSI levels were lied about? You really like loading your questions, don't you? You know, you're going to have to be more specific because I have no knowledge of any PSI lies. Come on. Apollo 1's tragedy was a result of failures by North American, the contractor. They didn't respond to astronauts' recommendations about faulty wiring and about hatch operations. Now, all the allegations that the capsule was destroyed in order to kill Gus Grissom, does that really make sense? Killing an astronaut can be done in a much less public, expensive, or time-consuming way. If you're under an intense deadline, Line, do you destroy useful personnel and equipment in that way? Huh? No. There are cheaper ways to kill someone without shooting yourself in the process. The allegations are groundless. Question number nine. Why do you think James Van Allen changed his mind on all his radiation theories long after he had years of documented evidence otherwise? All his radiation theories? You love leading with your questions. It's, it's comical. James Van Allen never changed his mind. The initial data from the early exploration of the belts was done using simple Geiger counters that weren't even attenuated properly, simply because Van Allen and the others working with him had no way of knowing what they were going to encounter. When scientists begin to study something and they report what they think they're seeing, it may look much different after 10 years of study. That's not changing your mind, it's presenting clarifying data. Van Allen was often thought to be in favor of fewer manned missions and more unmanned exploration of space. Fine. But that doesn't mean that he ever believed man flight to the moon was impossible or necessarily lethal in terms of radiation. Question number 10. Why would Phil Plate hang around a known pedophile like the amazing Randy? <laughs> What does this question have to do with scientific truth, anyway? This question presupposes some kind of false connection with Apollo. It's a perfect example, a classroom example of an ad hominem argument. Suppose, PT, hypothetically, that Plate himself is a horrifying person, and he tortures puppies, and he eats children alive. And, of course, he doesn't. But suppose that Plate believes 2 plus 2 equals 4. Now, along comes the late Mother Teresa, and she believes 2 plus 2 equals 5. Is Plate's math incorrect? Because, hypothetically speaking, he has terrible personal character. Is Mother Teresa's math correct? Because she's a good person? Come on, what's with this question? 
I don't know either of these people, and their character has no bearing on the issue at hand any more than a certain Australian conspiracy theorist's fascination with sexually provocative animations of little girls has bearing on his arguments. This was a test. Gee, I hope I get a good score. On the other hand, I could care less. I only hope that my answers give PT1 Guard and a few others of you out there some food for thought. Enjoy. Enjoy.